this is also something that has never been seen before. <laughs> what do you got? This, do you actually? It's a whole ream of scripts and notes. Oh boy, that is the JMG channel. Oh, it's a binder. And this is a hard copy of all of the scripts. Wow. All. So this is my conversation with John Michael Godier. We discuss a variety of topics, including the ancestor simulation, Laplace's demon and determinism, free will, the many worlds theory, infinite universe, black holes, time travel, uh, his upcoming book, the JMG channel, Event Horizon channel, life before being an author, the potential of a Q&A and live stream, of course, the Fermi paradox and zoo hypothesis, and UFOs and UAPs. I hope you enjoy. First, for those uh, who are watching, I am speaking with uh, science fiction author, <laughs> podcaster, YouTube content creator, and to my mind, one of the best science communicators you will find, John Michael Godier. Uh, again, John, thanks so much for doing this. It's an honor. Oh, no problem, man. And I'm happy to be here. <laughs> well, um, as I was telling Ross, I have recently read uh, both Supermind and uh, The Salvagers. I actually have them here next to me and uh, thoroughly enjoyed them both. Um, you don't speak too much about your books other than the fact that you uh, have Supermind at the end of each video. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, I don't I, I you know, if you think about it, though, um, I don't. I don't make any of my channels about me. So, you know, it's about the ideas. So I just, you know, I use the books and as, you know, just to say, this is what I do, you know, but, uh, but other than that, it's, it's, it's all about what I'm actually talking about. So. Yeah. You, you very rarely say much about yourself. So I hope it's okay if I ask you, you know, nothing sure. personal, but a, a little bit about, uh, about yourself that, uh, sure. that I think some of the fans might want to know, or at least I do. Um, but I guess I'll, I'll begin with Supermind. Um, that's the first uh, I read that first and I absolutely loved it. Um, it's actually s sad coming to towards the end. It was kind of like getting towards the end of a, a season of a television show where you don't want it to end. And there's only two episodes left. That's how I felt when there's like 20 pages left. I was like, oh, man. Uh, but then I had the salvagers uh, to read afterwards. So so I was looking forward to that. But as far as Supermind, I was uh, a little surprised because you don't speak that much about AI, you, you know, in your videos, you do a lot of astronomy and astrophysics and aliens and, or, or potential for life in the universe. Um, you know, uh, James Webb telescope videos. Uh, and then here's this book that you wrote where you explore all these concepts um, that involving AI and uh, the ancestor simulation. Um, I guess uh, my first question for you really is, uh, is a true, do you think it's a, an ancestor simulation, a true ancestor simulation is possible in real life? Like, so in the book, of course, you had, um, tell me if I'm saying this right. Is it Samuel and Cater? Quater? How do you? Oh, uh, yes. Them? They're actually, those are uh, Samuel and, and Kadir. Samuel. And they, you know, they're acronyms, but they actually do have meanings in Arabic that they're sort of, I, when I wrote that book, I, uh, I sort of did, it gave a nod to certain biblical ideas. Um, I'm personally not religious, but you know these are important to human culture. And what I was trying to do is incorporate all aspects of human culture into the book to show, at least I hope, to show the effects of uh, generalized artificial intelligence on everything. You know, every aspect of the human character. And I think I got that generally right with that book. I'm still happy with that book uh, five years later. So. Um, I, uh, what I wanted to do was project the fears that I had then, which but it would have been around 2017, of the coming age of artificial intelligence. But there's a problem. I actually envisioned that about 50 years in the future. Uh, a bunch of things have happened recently. <laughs> that means that I very much overestimated that. And that story could take place in 10 years, the way we're going with artificial intelligence. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is pretty crazy. I mean, um, yeah, five years ago, I, I was just uh, speaking with Ross and we were saying, uh, you know, who is it? Um, not Max Tegmark, but um, I forget the, the name now, but 
he was saying uh, he thought we'd have like maybe AGI or this is about 30 years out. And now he's saying five years out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, even five years is, I feel like is such a long time the way things are going. I don't even know if you could predict five years from now. I mean, you had on a guest, I'm getting a little off track, but you had a guest um, about a month ago where it's one of your few videos where you spoke about um, AI and chat GPT. Of course, it's all the rage now, but I was just re-listening to that video and it's amazing how only a month ago, I mean, you published it a month ago. I assume it wasn't much older than that. Um, some of the things that you asked the guest, if they were to come true or whatever, have already come true. <laughs> like like it um, apparently ChatGPT is teaching itself now and some kind of learning loop. Um, but yeah, I have plenty of AI questions for you. So, so, but getting back to the book, in the book, they had that ancestor simulation. And yes. um, do you think oh. such a thing is possible in real life? I've, I've wondered this before. Is it possible to take all the information that we have with uh, some amount of computer, computing power and actually reproduce uh, the past or even the future? That is a complicated question. And you already asked it and I forgot, which shows you, <laughs> shows you how my brain works. Um, the, uh, the reality is that there is two ways to do it. And it really depends on what resolution you want, okay? In a low resolution one, it just becomes a computer model and you can do that. You can simulate something to a, a pretty high degree. And we do that with, you know, astrophysics where we model, you know, I don't know, exploding stars or something. The entire universe, that's a lot harder. You're going to need a lot of computing power to do that. To do it at the resolution that the universe is, all the way down to the atom and all of that, can't do it because you actually need so much computing power to do that kind of an ancestor simulation that there's not enough matter in the universe to do it. Okay. Unless the universe is simulating itself, then <laughs> there you go. But that, yeah, you are limited by that. That does not mean that this isn't a simulation, however, because we don't know what the upper order would be. So maybe whoever is running the simulation or created the simulation, if anyone, maybe they have resources that we don't. So, right. You, can, you know. So inside the simulation is limited by the resources of the simulation and therefore yes. you can't reproduce the exact simulation. That's exactly correct. Okay. Uh, unless it's itself, unless it's doing it itself. So if the universe itself is the simulator and it's simulating itself, <laughs> well, right, right. Yeah, there you go. Uh, or if it's like a Boltzmann brain locked in another universe that's dead and there's nothing except blackness. And it's like, well, I'm going to try and figure out what this used to be. So it concocts its own simulation and you know that you could go that route. The thing is though, is that the, the reality of the, any, any, any flavor of the simulation theory is that, Number one, you can't ever know. And number two, you can't prove it. It's just essentially a thought experiment. Um, but what I was thinking about when I wrote the novel, I was thinking, well, what if you could, you know, what if you could do it? What would what would that look like? You know? Yep. I'm wondering the same thing. I mean, in, in the book you had it. So it's really, it turned out to be an approximation, which led to all kinds of problems. <laughs> right. Uh, and to, to the, when we discovered that, um, but like you said, a thought experiment still exists where, you know, I think uh, you've probably heard of Laplace's demon. I mm -hmm. think I pronounced oh, it. Oh, yeah. Name. Oh, yeah. That's, I find that fascinating. Um, the whole concept of, you know, having all the information and all the computing power in the world and, the, you know, beyond infinite, infinite computing power, I suppose. Um, do you think so? In theory, then uh, it's not maybe not possible in reality for us, but in theory, you think. Uh, such a thing would be possible it's, and and going in forward in time as well like uh, do you think that if we knew the position of every atom and the, every bit of energy uh, at this moment we could predict um, the, the rest of the future well um, to a degree you can yes um, but that gets into determinism whether this is all you know we're following a sort of a predestinate you know predestined set of rules that govern all behavior in the universe across its entire history, or if it's not, and it's just a lot of random chance. Now, I like random chance because the quantum mechanical world seems to like it. You know, it's all about probabilities, but you can't really nail anything down. So for me, you know, coming out at it from a quantum mechanical point of view, there it, it's just, it's all chance, you know. Um, 
which would be very difficult to simulate, you know? Um, so I don't know that you could ever reconstruct history that way, or if you could, you know, predict the future with it, but we don't actually know that you might be able to. And it's, there's nothing that says, a uh, you know, if you see an atom of helium moving across space, well, you can work out where it came from. Right. So you can, you can figure out it's past up until it interacts with something in the past, you know? So it becomes a question of, yes, you can do it partially, but just like in a game of pool, you can watch the last three shots of the game and watch the, the remaining balls go into the pockets, mm. but you can't reconstruct the entire game from what you just saw. If you didn't watch the entire game, you can't predict yeah. backwards. Oh, that's true. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and you I, can't I, predict I, forwards yeah. because there's so many variables playing into how that game is going to play out all you can really do is kind of estimate and say, well, that this guy's pretty good. You know, he's right. probably, you know, um, so that's all you can really do. And I think the universe works that way. My suspicion anyway, nobody yeah. really knows though. Is it true? Is it definitely a hundred percent fact that there is randomness or probably, you know, 50, 50 probability or some randomness in the quantum level. Cause I, I feel like that would throw a monkey wrench in the whole, in the whole, yeah, uh, the whole possibility of <laughs> the future for sure. The um, a, a good example here is um, <laughs> all right, radioactive decay. Okay, you have a single atom of uranium, um, and say it has a half life of four and a half billion years. It's, it's you know that isotope. Okay, you can say that there is a fifty percent chance that it will decay in that time period, but you cannot predict when the decay will happen. It's utterly random. Oh, could wow. happen anytime. So in that sense, and that's an atom, remember, that's above the quantum scale. So although it's obviously behaving in a quantum mechanical way. So that means that there is some level of randomness, um, which you can't really go further than that. You can just say, yeah, nuclear decay is random, but you can't really scale that up to, you know, uh, what I chose to eat for breakfast wasn't random, you know, or something like that. You can't quite go that far. Um, but there is randomness in the universe. Yes. Yeah. Demonst demonstrably. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so randomness aside, because uh, I guess this is more of a philosophy related question, but, but related, um, where do you stand on free will? Right. So, cause it's kind of ties into this whole, ancestor simulation and you know knowing every you know knowing everything are we all just you know physics and the physics uh, you know in current situation plus randomness produces the future uh so so yeah what is your opinion on free will does it exist or is it an illusion well i can tell you that i, I rather like it and hope that <laughs> i hope that it exists but i don't think anybody can answer the question um that's again that's determinism and indeterminism and i don't think that there's really a consensus on that um no yet so i think just all i can give you is a gut feeling is that yeah i think free will exists i think there's some something built in that that allows the uh, the randomness and that this is not all predestined you know um just because i don't see in my life any indication that it is you know mm. um i mean look i'm an accidental youtuber you know i couldn't have predicted that and I just don't know that the the universe could either, you know. Plus, that would be that would bother me if all possible timelines of life all lead to the same thing, you know. Because for me, that would mean that I am merely a tool of YouTube eternally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, I like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, wait, that's not necessarily a bad thing. No, not necessarily, but. Yeah. All right. So, so you, you tend to, to believe in free will and there's definitely no consensus. I mean, there's plenty of people on both sides. Uh, I listened to Sam Harris who argues, um, you know, the free will is an illusion and it, he makes a very strong case in my opinion. Then you have like, uh, well, basically everyone else or a lot of other people who would argue like Dan Dennett, that, uh, there is an element there, free will. It's just interesting. And I was wondering where you came down on that. Well, you know, another thing, too, and again, I, I can't really give you a scientific answer, but just a personal answer. I, I would much rather have a world where really horrible things like World War II didn't have to happen. You know what I mean? That maybe in some alternate timeline, it didn't happen. 
you know, or something like that. And you know, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I like that because maybe there's a perfect world somewhere, you know, that isn't doesn't have the horrible history that that our timeline does, you know. Um, but that's again, that's just a personal thing that I, I like to think, but I can't I can't back it up. I, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. That was actually on my list of topics I wanted to ask you about the the many world theory. Uh, I've had it or I've heard it um, explained uh, probably more than anyone by Sean Carroll, mm -hmm. who you, I'm sure you you, you know and uh, would make a great guest. By the way, have you? Have you ever oh, it's already it? happened. It already happened. Back in the archives of Event Horizon, no there's indeed a discussion with uh, Sean Carroll, and uh, yeah, he's the big proponent of uh, the many worlds hypothesis. Yeah. Um, Again, there's no consensus on that because, you know, the big problem with these theories, the big problem, and this also goes for the multiverse in any flavor. How do you measure it? You know, how do you prove it? Uh, there appears to be no real connection. So if it is a mini world situation that we're in, all you really have is that interpretation of, you know, quantum wave function collapse. And that's where it stops because you don't have a way to measure these other realities uh, that we know of. Um, so I, it, experiments are important and um, we just don't have it with that yet. Yeah, I, I, I know Sean Carroll is like a brilliant guy and I know really nothing. I'm not a physicist, but it just it's so hard to. I mean, you almost just have to believe him because he's such a you know smart yeah. and expert in the subject. Oh, it's it's, it's a so totally hard. it's a totally legit line of uh, of reasoning and research. I mean, yeah. all you you know, it's one of those areas of science where you go could be you know, but his his arguments for it are very good, um, and it's it's a totally legit um, within uh, mainstream physics. It's a totally legit possibility. Absolutely. Um, so the many worlds to me is, is, I guess it's similar, but different from like an infinite universe. Right. So, so some people, I've, we yeah. definitely have the observable universe yes. and that's, that's clear. We don't know what goes beyond that or if it does anything or, or everything. What do you, do you think the universe could be infinite, which, you know, and all that implies and would come with being infinite and means everything else that exists that could exist and, uh, how do you feel about that? Does infinity exist in real life? And is the universe infinite? There we've got an indicator. Okay. The, the infinite universe has a, it's not just a conjecture because there's one thing that we've, we know for sure at this point. And what that is, is that the universe's geometry is flat. Okay. So if you go out, you got a set of train tracks, envision just two train tracks running parallel, and you run them all the way halfway across the universe, they will never meet. They will always be parallel, which means that the universe's geometry is flat. That can mean one of three things, but one of those three things is that the universe is infinite. And if that's the case, that ends the Fermi paradox right there, because in infinity, it's impossible to be alone. Right. So there, there's the end of the paradox right there. So it is possible that we could prove at some point if we eliminate the other possibilities of, you know, geometries of the universe, that we could prove that it must be infinite. So there's some hope there as, as to proving that. But that comes with, like I said, a whole lot of weird, interesting, spooky stuff, you know. Yeah, uh, literally infinite, unimagined <laughs> things we yep. can imagine and uh, many th infinite things we can't. But does it, since the Big Bang, we, we've we measured the expansion of the universe and it's mm -hmm. uh, spreading out at faster than the speed of light because it's uh, growing, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Aside from uh, expanding. Yeah. It, it, given those two things, we know the rate of which it's, you know, we know the speed of light and we know, or do, and this is more of a question, do we know the rate at which it's, the new, I guess, space time is is expanding. Can we just combine those two to figure out how big the unobservable universe is? No, there's reasons that you can't, and it's entirely in the mathematics, admittedly. But you can't place that parameter on it. Um, but what you can do is is measure the expansion of the universe. We know that's going on. You know, um, we can actually see that in the redshift of galaxies and everything like that. We know it's expanding. Uh, and it brings you back to a point, the Big Bang, but it doesn't actually address whether the universe is finite or infinite, just because of how that works mathematically. It's very hard to envision it. 
but it deals more with geometries of the universe and things like that. And when you get into that, you see that it, it, it does actually work that way. Um, but it also could simply mean that it's not infinite and that it all just came from the big bang. Another question is, is what is the universe expanding into? Is it expanding into a previous universe that's, you know, infinite? Um, and then it's all like soap bubbles where big bangs are going off in this huge matrix of a, of an already expanded universe from long, long ago. And that was actually a point by Roger Penrose in his, um, which is a variation of this, but it's a, a cyclic, you know, cyclic and formal cosmology, I think. Uh, and there it's just, this is just one iteration, big bang after big bang. And they just keep going, you know, infinitely which is another type of infinite universe. But there, there's also a possibility of experimentation because you might be able to find um, remnants of the previous universe's black holes mm -hmm. hidden in the anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background radiation. You could see pockmarks, essentially, where, where the previous universe's black holes were. Or... There's, and there's some question there, there are, we're starting to find out that some black holes appear to be too massive for the amount of time that the universe has existed. Really? And maybe those represent black holes from a previous iteration of the universe that have survived. Mm. Um, that's, that's one of the big questions. And one of the, one of the mysteries revealed by the James Webb space telescope so far is that, yeah, some of these supermassive black holes are a little bit too big for the amount of time that they've been around accreting material. How, how, how could that be? It's not just a matter of um, how much matter they just happen to be near and how's the time. Yeah, you can to estimate, like you can estimate, there's only so much material in a galaxy and you can kind of estimate and they can't pull from infinite distance, you know, essentially uh, because I, gravitationally, you, you know, there's this, if you got a gas cloud here and there's a star right here, it's not going to go towards that black hole. It's way over there. Sure. So, um, so you've got all kinds of physics going on that, that would sort of prevent that. And it gives you a way to estimate how massive a supermassive black hole should be. And okay. yeah, on, on a minute scale, you're not going to be able to tell, but on this scale, on a huge scale, they're t way too massive. It's a lot of mass that we're talking about, but it could also simply be that the observations are in error or anything like that. This is brand new cutting edge stuff that I haven't even talked about yet. So gotcha. on my channels. Since you brought up black holes, I, I have kind of two questions about black holes. Um, I've heard people say, you know, or, or at least postulate that portals, uh, there could be a portal to another universe. And I've also heard it said that um, we may live inside a black hole, or at least videos that trying to explore that question. Mm -hmm. Before, I, what do you make of that? Is it, To me, I thought a black hole was simply mass that is just accumulated and its gravity is so great now it's so dense that you know so i'm picturing at the center of a black hole literally mass that's denser than a neutron star uh, not a portal or you know another universe so can, can you explain why people yes. claim that how in depth do you want me to go <laughs> uh <laughs> as in depth as uh needed to for me to wrap my head around this i suppose because it doesn't make any sense to me that people would say that okay so picture a star a normal star like the sun all right and the sun's holding its equilibrium by having a bunch of radiation coming through and you know it's holding its shape mm -hmm. eventually the sun changes the equilibrium and it becomes it swells into a red giant and then after that it blows the layers off and what's left is a white dwarf okay sure the white dwarf is the super dense remnant of the sun's core then you come along with a big, huge amount of mass, you know, a bunch of Jupiters, and you start dropping them into that white dwarf. What's holding the white dwarf up is um, is electron degeneracy pressure, you know, the electron cloud just holding this thing, keeping That's it straight. Magnetic force, yeah? Yeah. So once you add enough mass, you're dropping Jupiters in there. Mm -hmm. Eventually, it hits something called the chandra sekhar limit where the gravity defeats the electron degeneracy and it collapses into a neutron star, okay? What's holding the neutron star together and keeping it from becoming a black hole is 
neutron degeneracy pressure. Okay. So you start throwing Jupiters in again into the neutron star, and eventually it overcomes that limit. And that limit is... uh. uh anyway, there's a limit there. There's a, yeah, there's a hard number. There's a limit, Not yeah. a mass, yeah, okay. Um, and it, it's, let's see. Pullman-Oppenheimer-Volkov limit. Anyway, can't believe I was able to pull that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, the uh, I knew it was there somewhere, and then all of a sudden it... It came out. Anyway, that's what the birth of a black hole. And there is nothing left to keep it from collapsing. You know, there's no pressures left sure. that can that can keep that can stop it. The black hole then collapses down to ostensibly a singularity, but in a rotating black hole, which it's gonna be rotating because it was once a star, um it actually takes the form of what's called a Kerr ring. So it's actually a ring in there. Spinning okay. of infinite density. Okay. So it's an infinitely dense ring. The thing is, is that when you get that much gravity together and distorting, you know, it's a very highly distorted piece of what was formerly space time in that black hole. Mm -hmm. You get into general relativity and that theory of gravitation and general relativity at that point breaks down. Stops predicting, gives nonsense numbers. And that's a problem, number one, because that's that's one of the reasons we can't figure out what a black hole is really like in the interior is because general relativity doesn't predict properly. Okay. Anyway, but one solution to general relativity is the wormhole, the Einstein-Rosen bridge, where, you know, you obviously you can famously connect two distant points in space, you know. Like folding a piece of paper, yeah. Like folding the piece of paper from uh, Interstellar. Well, anyway, that looks like this, sort of. So that leads people to say, well, maybe it's a wormhole. doesn't mean it's traversable. It probably isn't, but it might connect to diff different points in space. But other people have interpreted it as it could be a different universe entirely, and there's a good reason for that. When you look at the mathematics that we know, governing a black hole looks suspiciously like the Big Bang. So they people have hypothesized white holes and that mm -hmm. we live on the other side of a black hole and that we're actually in a white hole. Mm -hmm. And our universe represents all of the material or so, in some way that black hole had accreted, you know, and then it just goes exploding out the other side as a new universe. Um, but it's going to be a long time before we know the answer to these questions because... We just don't have access to a black hole and we don't have a complete <laughs> understanding of physics. So yeah, you know, we're just, we're just shooting the breeze as it were. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that makes a little bit more sense. We're not like literally in a black hole, but kind of through the other side. Is that yeah. more appropriate? More yeah. Appropriate? The other side of it. Um, and that the big, the big bang singularity was the, the, you know, the end point of that black hole. Um, and probably the end of that black hole, really, because, oh, well, you could tell yourself a story that, that it's, it, well, no, it wouldn't be that. Yeah, and I don't know. Yeah, but that, <laughs> that's the idea is that that we're, we're in the, the, the other side of a black hole and that, you know, the matter is coming out instead of going in. Sure, the matter, all well, the matter in our universe was the, essentially the core of a black hole, I guess, if I'm understanding what you're saying. Mm. essentially that yes um and that the but there are in a modern context there's i think there are a few problems with it though um the big debate before stephen hawking passed away was you know do black holes preserve information or is information destroyed when it goes into the black hole right and i have a sneaking suspicion that's going to have a bearing on this um whether or not, you know, any information from that previous universe is preserved in ours, probably not. Um, so. Do, so you do you think we're, it, information is destroyed, which I guess was once thought to be like uh, against the laws of the universe, right? I, I, I would bet that it, you can't destroy it. Hmm. But at the same time, I can't explain the physics of a black hole because no one can. And I would. I would say that the universe in every other regard does not let you destroy information. So it may not do it there. 
everything's uh, contained and preserved in one form or, or another, I guess. That's actually one of the biggest things that freak me out about what I do is thinking about how this universe, matter, energy, all that stuff. That's that's one thing, but it really is. It's about information and information storage, you know, um, ultimately when you get down to it. And when you look at things like the speed of light, that is the speed at which information can transfer in the universe, the highest speed. That's yeah. all that is. Right. And um, everything also sort of coincides with it. You know, people are like, well, faster than light travel. There's a problem, though. It's also the speed of time, because at the speed of light, time stops. So all of these things coincide at that, you know, at C, the speed of light. And that's kind of suspicious looking in a way that everything would just sort of coincide right there. Um, and that's why when you ask, well, let's go faster than light. Well, you're also going faster than time. <laughs> yeah. Know? Would you so, go backwards in time? Yeah, then you go backwards. And, and any 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 FTL method that's been put forth so far also works as a time machine. So do you, uh, of course, that's just a theory. And, and we don't even know if fashion and light travel is possible. But uh, with or without, do you think, I mean, we know we can go forward and we're well, going forward into the future right now. We mm -hmm. can accelerate that by going uh, really fast or closer to a giant mass like a black hole is going back in time possible in your mind or, or is that off the table there's a few ways that it might be possible the problem is is that they're all really tall orders for example if you were able to stretch a tube a rotating tube the entire length of the universe mm -hmm. it would let you go back in time it would actually distort time in just such a way as to allow it but would that, how would that work? How is how it, do you build it? What's that? Well, it gets, it, that's also dependent on the geometry of the universe. I should caveat that. But the um, the thing is, is that it it's one way that physicists worked out that could allow backwards time travel. There's also questions about the extreme time distortions around a supermassive black hole. You know, maybe maybe something getting you know we don't really know that might allow it. But these types of solutions always can are constrained by. They can only take you back in time to the moment that whatever is method, like a black hole, it'll only take you back to the time it was created. It, you can't go back further than that. So that's what this sort of solution type stuff leads to is that it only goes back so far. Meaning that if you went out and built the giant cylinder, you can't go back in time because it was just created. So <laughs> right. You know, right. So there's all kinds of little problems uh, that that just points to a reality that this universe does not like backwards time travel as as fun as that would be um it, it it's it, there just seems to be so many problems with it and at the same time you know where are the time travelers i've i've never met one although i've been accused of being one uh, <laughs> yeah yeah um as, as well as an alien and yep. artificial intelligence all of that yeah, that's that's really funny. I've heard you mention that before. You, in the comments, people people love to claim you're uh, an AI or. <laughs> I have, I have, I have preempted my 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 detractors that mm -hmm. hypothesize that I'm an alien by claiming to be the Loch Ness monster. So that's 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 my out. I'm like, oh yeah, you want to know my origins, Loch Ness. Loch Ness. Um. Well, speaking of, uh, before we, I, I do want to ask you a lot about uh, Event Horizon, some of the guests and, and how you do your research there. Um, but before we do, I'd love to ask you, so so you've been YouTubing for, for how long now? I started in, uh, let's see, April of 2016. Oh, wow. I, that, that's that's even longer than I thought. Then your first video was on... Um, uh, Abby Star, KIC 8852. I, I have that star's phone number burned into my brain permanently i think i do too yeah <laughs> after uh all, all the videos uh, i've listened to you uh, discuss it um but before youtube i mean you're, you're 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 an author you're still an author um two years ago there was a video where you said that you had another book in the works and yes. i i remember i took note of that and um i don't think uh, at least uh, not in anything i've heard i haven't heard you mention it since how is the the new book coming? Is it still 
in the works? Is there an ETA? Can you share what it might be about, some kind of theme or plot? What can you tell me about uh, the next book? Well, you have scooped it because I have not discussed it uh, with anybody. Uh, the next book is well on its way. It's taking a lot longer, though, because I'm sort of watching certain things develop so that I don't accidentally date it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, but what I'm thinking about with this book, the premise. So the Salvagers and the um, Supermind take place in the solar system. Supermind is on Earth and the Salvagers is in the solar system. Mm -hmm. I went way further out than that. So I am trying to envision, and this has always been a, a real trick for science fiction. I'm trying to envision a truly alien life form, something that does not have any analog to life on Earth okay. that we might not even recognize as being alien. And that's the the essential exercise that I'm doing in the book is trying to create something so alien that, you know, you you wouldn't know that that's what that was, which is a solution to the Fermi paradox is that we don't know what aliens look like and that we just dismiss them as nature. Right. Um, so that's what I'm exploring with it. And I'm also exploring um, the nuts and bolts of interstellar travel at sublight speeds and how you would do that, you know, and there have been many visions, you know, generational ships and things like that. In this case, I'm mm -hmm. looking at the trials and troubles of keeping people alive for that long of a distance and how you would do it. Um, because it's, you know, either you hollow out an asteroid and build a city in it, or that's self-sufficient, or you use some other means. And that's what I'm exploring is some other means that looks much more um, up to date as far as the science goes than previous sci-fi. You know, in other words, you, you can't just, you can't just freeze somebody and then wake them up. You can't just do suspended animation and wake them up because our science has moved far enough to where we know what the problems with that are. You know what I mean? Right. Whereas in, in 1960, Arthur Clarke didn't know exactly what that would entail. So they just made assumptions, of course, which we all do that. OK, well, this will be possible. They'll they'll figure it out. I just don't explain what what's going on. Uh, although yes. Clark would have. Um, but the other sci fi authors, many of them wouldn't have. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, and yeah, that's that's where it's at. But I don't want to go any further because there, that would be spoilers. No worries. That's that's sounds cool. Um, actually, sounds like you know, in the end of this, at the end of the Salvagers, you kind of left it at, almost as if you intended to make a, a to write a sequel, yes. right? Uh, uh, you know, um, there was a new mission on the on the table. Uh, it exists. Yeah, that that manuscript's uh, about sixty percent done. Um, the problem with writing the Salvagers was. I had intended to write it as, you know, a mini volumes uh, space opera. Mm. And what I didn't expect was YouTube. Um, you know, I didn't expect that my, so, so, you know, when you're writing books, you have a literary agent and all that, and they tell you how to promote it because, you know, it's really hard to promote books these days. You have to get out there and, you know, do social media and everything. Yeah. And I thought, well, I'm not really very big on Facebook and, you know, things like that. I'll try a YouTube channel. Maybe I'll get a few hundred people watching. And it was more than that. So, <laughs> so that, that factored <laughs> in uh, promoting your books. That, that factored day. in and it slowed the books down because I'm um, always writing YouTube content. And um, but at the same time, though, what, what there's a benefit because uh, my research uh, habits are way more in depth than they were before. Um, you know, I, I mean, you, when, when YouTube and your writing and everything is your career, you have all the time to dedicate towards it. But if you're working a job or something, you have a lot less time, you know? Yeah. So the benefit is that my research habits are way deeper now than, than they ever were. I guess they, that gives you more of a, well, more ideas of what to write about and oh yeah, but allows yeah. it to be a little bit more scientifically accurate, I imagine. Right. Yep. And it also gives me a way to, you know, YouTube gives me a way to an, a further outlet for ideas that come to me. 
um, you know, different solutions to the Fermi paradox and all that that haven't been mentioned before. It gives me an outlet. I don't have to write a book about it. I can just make a video and and throw the idea out there or cover ideas, which is most of what I do, that I think are interesting and that, you know, other people, will, you know, like-minded people are going to find interesting too. Um, so that's, that's, but that takes a, I mean, that takes a huge amount of time. So the books, book writing process slows down in that, but well, I wouldn't change a thing though. Um, I'm really enjoying it. So. I could imagine that all the scripts you've written for um, your, your JMG channel it would probably add up to uh, multiple books <laughs> if I had to. Uh, yes. Well, pardon me one it's second. It's a whole ream of scripts and notes. Oh, boy. That is the JMG channel. Oh, it's a binder. And this is a hard copy of all of the scripts. Wow. All. Oh, boy. I don't even know how many scripts there are. Six, seven hundred, something like that at this point. I used to. I should know it. I usually watch the um the channel on um on random uh, on, uh, what's it called you know random uh, play I put I go to you have a playlist called the whole channel yes <laughs> and I like to go to that and hit shuffle and I just listen to videos and so what's interesting about doing doing it that way is I can kind of tell how old the video is mm -hmm. by your <laughs> outros <laughs> uh, how long I draw out the word live. Yes, that's one. Of, yep, that's yeah. one of the indicators. Exactly. This it's that's a dead giveaway most of the time, but um, it's interesting to to see them evolve. And I've been I wanted to ask you about your outros because I love them. They're hilarious. I look forward to them at the end. But how? And it seems like you enjoy you know the little bit the comedy at the end of the of the episode. Yes. You get to be well, the whole idea is that. Um, I take the subject matter seriously, but not myself, you know? Hmm. Um, so I, I like to have, I don't want to be treated as being too serious, you know, like this, this sort of um, reclusive guy that, you know, with no sense of humor that always talks about existential crises and things like that. Yeah. When that's not the reality, the reality is that I, yeah, I'm fascinated with that stuff, but I have a sort of, desire to uh at the end of of both this and event horizon sometimes turn the steam valve and let everything you know especially if it was a very particularly spooky or um crazy topic you know um or existentially frightening so i mean i think it's really really creative like uh it just makes me laugh that what is the deal with the possum, uh, the the LeBaron? Is there really, was there a LeBaron? Did you own a LeBaron? No, the LeBaron, uh, I am roped into buying a LeBaron at this point because of that. <laughs> yeah. So that I'm not a hypocrite. Um, I never owned a LeBaron. Um, I just was at one point, all right, what spawned the LeBaron, embarrassingly, I was talking about that time Elon Musk launched his car into space. Hmm when he launched the tesla yep. so i said what happens if aliens find that what if they don't like teslas so i i, I thought well I'll put in the outro that we should send <laughs> we should launch an 85 lebaron <laughs> in, into space with robert goulet playing on the tape deck oh, God. just in case the aliens would like that better and that started it and I, everybody in the comments you know i started hearing about lebaron so i ran with it mm. um the LeBaron in the canon of, of Event Horizon, however, is now off in space and after being modified into uh uplifted to artificial intelligence. So it's 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 left the room. It's in space <laughs> going to parts unknown. What about the uh quantum mechanical possum? Where, where, oh yes. <laughs> where did that come quantum from? mechanical possum? It actually has a name. Did you? I, we, I don't know if we've ever actually said that, but said it, well, you've said it once, and I can't think of it. But I know you said it. He, his name is Doctor uh, Sprocket Slaughter Bartfast Van Beek. Oh, boy. And, yes, and um, that idea came initially from how I interact with my cats. So you know, your cats walking on a you know a ledge or something, or doing you know batting at something. So my natural inclination is I'm like, what, you know, and, um, and Anna, whoever she may be is, uh, found that funny. And we sort of, you know, one night came up with this idea of, um, of the quantum mechanical possum. And as I recall how that hat, that, what that broke was Anna had put a box on the front porch 
and the possum was in the box like Schrodinger's cat. And I had to climb in and there it was. And that's why it's quantum mechanical is because it's Schrodinger's possum, but it's twisted around in that it's actually Schrodinger's human because I ended up in the box. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, I got gotcha. you. That's funny. Yeah. I, that's who does the voice for the, well, the snickering for the possum. Is it you? Oh no, it isn't me. Uh, but I can't reveal it. Okay. Secret. The the identity of the snickering possum uh, must not be divulged. Remains a mystery. Okay. It remains a mystery. No worries. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I definitely really enjoy the outros. Keep them coming, please. Uh, very funny, and I'm sure I'm not alone. I, um, I was actually writing one when uh, just before we met up. I was nice. uh, writing the outro to a video that will come out tomorrow on my original channel. Sweet. Uh, can't wait. Um, the Event Horizon, your guess. Mm -hmm. John, you have an uncanny ability to ask good questions. <laughs> I can't tell you. It's like listening to a broken record. I can make a, I've considered making like a highlight reel of all your guests saying that's a good question. <laughs> so I listen to a lot of podcasts with a lot of people who interview guests. And uh, just it just you know sticks out like a sore thumb when your guests say that's a good question and mo many times per episode over and over. How I, I kind of know half part of the answer because you mentioned this in a recent interview. Um, how do you come up with your questions? Do your research? How are you so knowledgeable going in? Uh, that's the key. Is mm -hmm. that um, I only going to do an interview on a subject that I'm interested in. If I had to give a uh, conduct an interview with uh, a sports star or something like that, I would be absolutely terrible because I don't have the inherent interest in it. Right. Astrophysics, I live, eat and breathe astronomy, you know, as I'm sure you can tell. <laughs> so the, that means that I can read all of the papers that the uh, guest has written and familiarize myself with the subject well ahead of time and then just sort of sit you know, one of my, one of my parts of my process is sitting out on my porch in the middle of the night, you know, glass of wine and mm -hmm. just thinking and looking, you know, looking up at the night sky. And that's when a lot of the questions come to me. And what I do then, which I can also show you because it's right here. <laughs> You're getting all kinds of behind the scenes stuff here. Nice. Love it. Love it. Yeah, this is how this works. So sitting out on that porch with a yellow legal pad and a pencil, and I start taking notes. Nice. Old school. <laughs> old school. Yep. And this particular one is um, not released. I can't tell you about this one, that one. But mm. this one is Daryl Seligman and, and Jennifer Bergner on Oumuamua and the outgassing, uh, hydrogen outgassing episode from two, three weeks ago. Uh, so, yeah. I, I feel like I, I can, I contributed to the naming that video or titling that video. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is it Ross who asks, uh, you know, what occasionally he, he puts it out to the, the, you know, YouTube, um, support. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. when, yeah. He, when he can't think of a good title. And I feel like I've contributed to at least two titles now. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, thank you. Because that's not always easy. Um, coming up with titles is something that we uh, we have to put a fair amount of time in there because we want to be accurate, but we also don't want YouTube to tank it, you know, and then also we want it to be interesting, you know, so yeah. we have a lot of a lot of discussion internally on what to title stuff. And, you know, we also like to ask permission from the scientists and say, are you comfortable with this title? You know, do you? Like that. So that's actually a process, the coming up with the titles. Um my original channel is just me coming up with the titles. So there, you'll notice that they're they're kind of different in how they're, the, the two channels are titled. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I had no idea that you actually went to the um, the scientist or the, your guest and made sure they approved the title. That's interesting. I don't want them to be unhappy with the end result, the end product. So I I make it, uh, if they want to stop an interview since I pre-recorded and retake a question, we can do things like that. But I almost never have to. Um, you know, I'm almost never, I just usually just one shot, but, um, 
but yeah, there's they, we do that. We keep in touch with them, and that's why a lot of them are repeat guests. Is we're in touch with uh, in touch with them because they liked how I did it, you know. Um, Definitely. And what I want to do, of course, is present it to the audience, but not waste their time, you know. Um, and that's another thing that factors into my questions is I I think that through ahead of time and make these points, you know, to bring up and th that reminds me of what I want to ask, you know, um, but I don't like actually write out questions beforehand, just points. And, um, then I, you know, then I articulate it just live and, um, it usually works. Now I do occasionally ask a stupid question, of course, but, <laughs> uh, but most of the time, just because I'm hyper familiar with the material, I, I can get in depth and know, you know, know what I'm doing. A lot of people, especially professional people on like television or something like that, aren't that in depth prepared. And that's why you don't get that that flavor of questions out of them. Yeah, it seems pretty clear that you've read their like, especially if they've recently published a paper that's, uh, you know, relatively. I popular. read them all. You've I read, read them all. And, and and that actually, honestly, that that's a lot of how we determine who who to ask on the show is mm -hmm. by their papers coming out. And I use a site. Everybody uses the site archive that's mm -hmm. uh, put on by Cornell University where preprint papers come up every day, every weekday. And I comb through on my with my coffee every morning, you know, reading papers. And that's how, you know, once I see something interesting, I'm like, hey, Ross, we should book this guest or try to, you know. And the scientists more often than not, way more often than not, almost always say, yeah, absolutely. Because they're passionate about what they do. And that that also drives the interviews, the the passion of the scientists. You know, you're talking about what they really love to do. And you, you know, you get you get a sort of a certain magic, you know. Yeah, that that's really cool. I mean, you you mentioned that archive uh, website because one of your guests recently said mm -hmm. that's how they start their morning. And you're like, that's how I start my morning, coffee and archive. And you read the yep. read the articles. And and I was actually intended to ask you. Is that how you um, basically uh, identify your your guests or your potential guests? Mm -hmm. It sounds like that that's the case. That's exactly the case. Um, but I also, you know, Ross will see something in interviews or whatever and say, hey, this might be a good guest or, you know, I'll see something. So it's not all guests that come out that way, but most are based on new papers. Mm -hmm. And we, that's why we sort of keep the discussion about that paper, you know, usually. Um, but that's with the scientist guests. Now, when I stray out and go with, uh, you know, another YouTuber or something like that, then it's free form. Like, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I talked to Joe Scott, you know, a few weeks ago and Isaac cool. Arthur shows up uh, at least once a year and that's just free form conversation. Yes. You have your annual conversation with Isaac Arthur. He's definitely yes. um, one of my favorite guests uh, for sure. Yes. And I, well, I've known Isaac for a very long time now. So yeah. Yeah, and and you turned me on to his channel, which I I also enjoy. Um, yeah, yeah, me too. That's I see. I, I can't watch myself, you know. So <laughs> I, Isaac is my go to for for this the same content, you know. Yeah, similar similar but different. He, he does more of bit different. Yeah, speculation. You do a lot more of um, science, uh, hard science, like right. communication. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sort of like the astronomer Isaac Arthur. You know, the the hmm. the, the cheap knockoff. You know, <laughs> no, he's just, just different. It's just different. It's different, yeah. Actually, honestly, the, it compliments though. Um, yeah, all of his channels complement each other. So I, I would also say, you know, if you really want to science, Fraser Cain or Anton Petrov or you know, there's any number. It, that's one of the beauties of YouTube is there's no shortage of of science content. Yeah, you know, true. And you just uh, people are able to watch whatever they like, whoever they like, or watch them all and never run out of stuff to watch. You know. And if you get like a lot of the audience don't really even, you know, what's television, you know, <laughs> yeah. Why watch television when you're going to get much better at more in-depth information on uh, science YouTube, you know? Absolutely. I'm sure I'm not alone. I, you know, a lot of your um, viewers and subscribers probably also watch the same things I do. Uh, PBS space time and, oh, yeah. yep. you know, the list goes on. I'm sure. And the same things I watch, you know, of course. Um, to the questions you ask your guests, though, um, what percentage are legitimate questions that you actually read and you have questions even after reading the paper or how many of them are more for the audience, maybe who hasn't read the paper and you're kind of just um, oh, there's a them good, for us? 
50 50. Um, of course, what I, you know, some of them I already know the answer to because I read the paper. Yeah. So what I'm trying to do is articulate it in such a way that it, it makes the information clear to the listener, you know, <laughs> and um, that means that I, you know, I have to ask some of the basic questions. Mm-hmm. I can do it in such a way where it elicits a complicated response because I just assume that the audience is scientifically literate people, which they are, and um, they want a little bit deeper of an answer than than what you would get from a, you know, a, a pop science channel or something like that. So I go a little bit more in depth, but I got to cover the basics so that the ideas are clear. Yeah, because we, we all haven't read the, the paper like you. So that, right. that's that's perfect. Yeah. Many of the guests, um, I don't know about many, but some some are very familiar with your channel and your, what you've uh, you know talked about for for all these years. Others seem ex- totally unfamiliar with your channel, and uh, so how do you take it? Like when um, when a guest maybe is uh, defines like what the Fermi paradox is, which is something you've spoken about countless times, and your audience is probably right. incredibly familiar. <laughs> how do you take it? And uh, when a, a guest does uh, something like that like to me as a as a viewer it's like doesn't he know john <laughs> it's spoken about this a million times we know it H- how do you view that how do you how do you respond to that a high level question out of nowhere out of left field um so in other words if say they say well let me explain the fermi paradox then i'm going to respond with well let me ask you about the zoo hypothesis mm. and so what i do is i i demonstrate the the broad knowledge of the audience to show that, yeah, no, they already know what this is. You know what I mean? Yeah. So by going more in depth is how I get to that, that zone of um, where, where the audience, you know, I, I know where the audience is going to be. And that's the beauty of a YouTube comment section, because that is a huge amount of feedback that tells me what people are, you know, what level people are interested in. You know what I mean? And with my comment section, which is a gigantic, um, exchange of ideas you know people post the most amazing ideas to me and that that's that's how i know what level to go you know is is by the feedback that i get and um what people you know what guests people like what what people don't like and um that's how i do it so it's it, there's a just a enormous gold mine of um of information and feedback in the comments sections of both channels and I read them religiously. That's after after the archive papers, I'm reading the comments and I read every single one because I want to know, you know, what I keep my finger on the pulse of the audience. You know what I mean? That's cool. Uh, and again, because I what I don't want to do is waste people's time. So I want to make it to where the content is worthwhile. Yeah. You know? And then that way, everybody's like, well, he's got a new video. up. You know, I got to go watch that. <laughs> the other thing is that that's only about half of what I do. The other half is relaxation and sleep. You know, people like to find a channel and and that relaxes them and uh, doze off to it. And tons of people do that. They call themselves the sleep crowd. And um, I'm happy that, that I can do that because I do the same thing. You know, I find these channels that, that are cathartic and I just put it on and doze off and I'm glad to be able to to help people that way and uh, get them to sleep too. Oh yeah, I'm part of that crowd. I um I often will will put it on in bed and uh, put in my earbuds and um put the channel on the the all videos playlist or the whole channel playlist and hit that shuffle button, and uh, it's great. It really it, you know I listen to it in the car and I also listen to it to go to sleep. So yeah, I, I I intend for it to be that way. You know that's why I'm not screaming and going on cam. Like, hey guys, you know I don't do any of that. I keep it calm and you know yeah. Um, the other thing too is that you know some people cope with with bad stuff depression anxiety and all that and it seems to help them and that you know that's that makes my stuff more than the sum of its parts you know it makes it much more important than just space talk so i'm very cognizant of all of that and um i'm glad that people find a benefit from it oh yeah i mean it's educational like i i can't tell you how much i've learned i, I can't even quantify how much i've learned just from watching the channel you know, I don't know how many hundreds of hours I've probably seen. I feel like I have a, not a, maybe not a bachelor's degree, but a minor in, uh, in astronomy or astrophysics, just uh, through all these hours of listening to the, 
the you know what I wonder? I wonder how many people learn something while they're asleep. Mm. You know, you got a YouTube channel on and subconsciously learn something while you're asleep. Or how does it affect people's dreams? You know, things like that. Interesting ideas. You read my mind. I was, I was just about to say, I, I can guarantee I've dream, I've dreamt, you know, sometimes occasionally about whatever topic uh, I probably fell asleep to, and uh, whether it's aliens or, um, well, I probably aliens more than anything. <laughs> but you know, uh, I've 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 definitely done it. I uh, yeah. I've had dreams um, because of the research and you know spending all day with scientific papers. Yeah, I will visualize that piece of space in a dream sometimes. And what's amazing about it is it feels absolutely real. You know, mm -hmm. looking at a nebula out in space is in in my dreams is more real than any CGI could ever do. You know, it's just it's it's and all of the realities of it, the silence of space and everything is all present in those dreams. I love it yeah. when that happens. So it's like the ultimate virtual reality, right? It's way better than uh, than anything we have in <laughs> dreams for nothing beats the brain. Nothing yeah. beats the mind, you know. <laughs> um I, I totally got uh, off track, but before before YouTube author 23 what was it 2013 the salvagers you published yes i wrote it in 2012 okay you you don't speak much about your life uh i guess i don't know prior to author were you, you still an author before then or you how did you nope. become an author and you you've made some small references to the things like making a living on the internet since you know well before then since 2000 maybe what can you tell you know what did you do before you decided to become an author and how, how what led you to be an author? I had a couple of different careers. Uh, I started out as a violin maker. <laughs> violin? <laughs> yes, I, I started out as a violin maker apprentice. And um, I actually did that because I didn't want to go to college because I would have had to take on an enormous amount of student debt. Mm. And I thought, and this was back in the 90s, and I was like, I, I just don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to to borrow my way into a career and then spend, you know, God knows how much time paying it back, which all of my friends did, you know, yeah. as a matter of fact, some of them are still carrying debt. So I didn't want to do that. So I, I decided to do sort of offbeat. Everything I've, everything I do is offbeat. It's, it's, you know, things that nobody else will do, but I do, I somehow I'm silly enough to do them. So I apprenticed as a violin maker and worked in, um, you know, musical instruments and things like that. Hmm. And then I had a hobby at the time, which was coin collecting. And I sort of grew that into an interest in ancient and medieval coinage, the very earliest days of coinage. And um, I became slowly and working for a dealer and I ultimately became a um, rare coin dealer as a result. Yeah, and I worked both in violins and coins and um, e-commerce, you know, eBay, things like that, websites. And then I um, did a lot of work for auction houses and things like that, especially in regards to salvaging coins from the ocean, you know, sea salvage. And um, so I was involved with that for a number of years. And that career required constant travel, okay, because you have to do trade shows. And I was doing them for, you know, for coins to sell coins and do these trade shows. And almost every weekend I was traveling somewhere. And while I did that, I was like starting to burn out, if that makes sense. And I did something that I wanted to do ever since I was a kid, a teenager, sit down and write a novel. <laughs> and so I wrote The Salvagers over the course of eight months in 2012 under constant travel in hotel rooms on a laptop. And um, that's that's how that came about. And um, lo and behold, the book actually did sell. So I um, began the transition and then, you know, your agent comes to you and says, you need to find a way to promote, as I said. And I was like, okay, I'll try YouTube. And that ultimately became a career of its own. Yeah. And I was able to semi-retire from everything else. Although I still, I certainly still dabble, you know, in, in my old career, but it's, I'm not dependent on it. So. Sure. That, that's, that's interesting. Cause I actually remember so the very little that you've mentioned about, you know, life, before YouTube or before being an author, you mentioned, you know, the coins, 
Um, I, I almost pinned you as like a, a treasure hunter of coins of sort. That's the way it sounded in the very, I think it was a, a conversation you had with um, either Avi or Amir Siraj. Am I saying it right? Amir Siraj, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cause well, they're, they're on the table. After. There's a Spanish 500 year old Spanish piece of eight that was found in what wreck is this? Uh, the princess Louisa. So I'm still, still doing it. Wow. Yeah. All right. So that makes sense. It, I was like, how, did John make a living on the internet while also being like a treasured coin hunter? And uh, you sold them on the internet. Uh, well, yeah, I, 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 I yeah. yeah, it was an early adopter of e-commerce. Um, mm -hmm. And I started that in 1997. Um, and, uh, you know, I did that. And there's there's actually a bunch of different jobs under that. You know, you're technically a numismatist, but there's a bunch of different jobs under it. You can do auction house work. You can do cataloging work, write books. You can do all of this sort of stuff, um, identify collections and catalog them for people. So I did a big mix of that all while um, doing violin work. Um, wow. So do you, have, do you have a violin around or, or not in the studio here, but I do have I, I do have several. Yes, still. Um, and I I ended up most of what I did was repairing them. Uh, but I did. Ultimately, there are three that I made out there that, you know, are sitting in symphonies and things like that. Do you play? Yeah, enough to enough to um, enough to know what I'm doing, but I concert violinist I am not. Um, mm. But I started out playing piano, and I can still well. There's a piano right there. Um, True. So that's that's honestly, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna play anything in practice, it's it's piano stuff. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, no, that's cool. Uh, thanks for that. You very rarely. Um give us any clue or about yourself you, you stick to the science so it's nice to see a little bit more about uh learn a little bit more about you yeah it's it's you know it's one of those things i keep it about the content hmm. but if people are curious yeah i actually did have kind of an interesting run <laughs> yeah. in um but uh it's not that i'm not just you know it's not that i'm secretive or not comfortable talking about anything it's that it's not going to it's it's tooting my own horn is not really what it's not me you know uh i want to get, ask you more science questions but before would you ever consider doing a q a maybe with your your patrons or your subscribers um a lot of you know people do that sending questions and you make an episode answering yes we actually we actually have plans to do that um at some point um take uh you know what i would love to be able to do is take audience calls or questions or something like that but that requires an infrastructure that's different from normal event horizon right yeah. and i just haven't found we just haven't found the time to to set it up but i would love to do it and i'm you know i'm perfectly happy to do q and a's i just haven't you know got to it yet yeah the, i mean q and a's would be awesome if you could take questions um by email or whatever but so would um I'd love to see you do a live stream, you know, whether it's with uh, whomever wants to join or whether it's with yeah. your supporters, that would be really that's, cool. That's in the works. Um, we started another channel, a JMG Clips channel, as it's okay. called. Mm -hmm. And the Clips channel is is a, is sort of a repository for things like everybody asks for much longer content, you know, so that they, you know, don't have to switch videos while they're going to sleep or something. So we're like, we'll string three or four of them together and make a four hour video that, but the, also there is just whatever we want to do. If Erin Knight wants to do some, you know, interesting content on her own, she can do that there, or we can do live streams. And live streams, we haven't done any yet, but that's 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 sort of a coming soon type of uh, thing. And I think it would be kind of funny, especially you know, with um, when it's not just me and I've got Erin Knight and uh, Ross with me, you know. That would be cool. I mean, we see uh, we see their names at the uh, the credits of every video, and we, uh, you know, I think anyone who watches your channel regularly uh, knows that Anna is Aaron Knight. It's no secret. Yes. <laughs> no, that's not secret. Um, and uh, we're all close friends behind the scenes. Okay. So, um, and I actually just the other night I was sitting there talking with uh, Aaron Knight for like three hours because was, we were bored, and uh, so the, yeah, we're all friends and that's one of the way reasons that event horizon comes out so good is that there's no, you know, it's not a workplace. It's, it's, you know, friends doing something, you know, as a project. 
And um, I think it would be fun if people saw the behind the scenes of it, you know, because to be honest with you, the the reality behind me and Aaron Knight is not that far off the mark of JMG and Anna. It's not too far. That's funny. Uh, you, so you guys all knew each other before you two oh, yeah. and you brought them into the fold as, as it went yes. on? Um, when I when I started my original channel, I, I had been contemplating doing a, a podcast and my my channel, my monologue channel just took off and I focused on that. But I always wanted to do interviews and I um, and I had some experience in it from previous things. So I got together. Ross has worked in radio and radio production and all that. And we sort of built it together. And I'd known Erin Knight for a number of years um, and brought her in and created a partnership to uh, to create the show. And it's I'm glad because it really has a different flavor than than what you would get if you do it alone. You know, um, I don't have I wouldn't have the time to do it alone. I'd need help. Um, two YouTube channels is is quite a handful, actually. Yeah. But um, that's that that's I, that's why Event Horizon just has a different sort of feel and flavor than my original channel. But you can, you can still tell us me. Um, yeah. So, yeah, no, music. No. It, it is different music usually. <laughs> yeah no it's totally different it seems at least seems to me that you know your jmg channel is is uh is all you i, I imagine or yep, pretty much and, then, yep. and uh you got a lot of help from obviously ross and then and you know all that she does is very funny and makes it a little bit more interesting. yeah she does all of the audio editing and oh. that's quite a huge task um oh, so wow. she does the audio editing she does the thumbnails and all of the um the uh cards and everything that you see in there um lower thirds things like that she's you know multi-talented she's a graphic designer voice artist you know a bunch of things so she does that and then ross does all the video editing you know so the sequences and all that and that's from his background in film and radio and then i you know i'm just the ear candy that's asking the questions so you do all I, the writing i imagine yes yeah <laughs> I, I have to. Um, yeah. that, that's actually kind of a thing because when I write something scripted, like on my original channel, if I tried to give someone else a script, first of all, I'd mess it up. But second of all, it wouldn't sound right. And so only my words, you know, go through my brain naturally, you know, um, so I can't imagine. I just I couldn't imagine do right. You know, delivering a script that somebody else wrote. I just yeah. It's the other thing too is YouTube requires a certain level of honesty. I think you know, and um, content creators that are shooting big that don't write their scripts. Yeah, I can tell. You know, <laughs> I can tell too. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not the worst thing in the world, but you can tell. It's uh, not the worst thing in the world, and that's how television works. But. Um, I think that the, you know, it's much better to have a certain authenticity on YouTube because it's YouTube, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm, I'm an old school YouTuber in that regard and that I don't I don't put anything out there that wasn't me, you know. Yeah, a lot, it seems like a lot of channels as they get, you know, rather uh, large amount of subscribers, they, they start hiring out some of the script writing and they're just more of a presenter and you can tell. And you can tell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't. I would never do that because it's just not me, you know. Um, I'm a, you know, I sort of like the, the whole ethic that launched YouTube, you know, where anybody could just make content, put it up there, and have a go, you know. And uh, I like that. I'm very much a, um, you know, you want to try YouTube, go for it, do it, you know, pull the trigger. Um, and I, I, I like that aspect of it. And what I don't like is seeing television on there you know yeah I know what, I, what i really like to see is people passionate about something you know um that are clearly enjoying what they do and i'll actually watch channels uh that have nothing to do with anything i care about it's just the per the, the person that's doing it is really good you know what i mean and i remember watching a a channel where a guy collects uh horror type masks you know okay and um I don't collect those. I don't have, but it was his enthusiasm and passion for his hobby though, made it a good channel, you know, it was entertaining. Um, and stuff I didn't know, you know, I didn't know anything about that kind of stuff. 
So that I think is the beauty of YouTube. And then I keep that in mind is, you know, I, I would feel like a total sellout if I, if I were to, you know, to do that. Now, that's not to say if somebody hires me to voice a you know video game or something like, oh, that's different, you know, yeah, uh, that's a different thing. But on my YouTube channel now, it's, it must be me. That's cool. Yeah, it shows. And uh, I think a lot of the viewers probably appreciate that. Um, John, I want to respect your time, but I have a couple more science questions for you. <laughs> um, sure. Mostly, uh, well, at fir first, at least, um, the Fermi paradox, of course, something you've spoken about, um, who knows how many videos. Who Hundreds of times. Yeah, and it's a, it's a really interesting topic, right? All the all the potential solutions. And uh, I mean, you, you like you said, you, you know over 100 at this point, right? Some, some more reason feasible than others, but still oh, very interesting. What you've said in multiple videos, I can almost quote you, that you see the zoo hypothesis as the worst one. Yes. Okay. And I, I've, you and I, I wouldn't say battled in the comments, but I, I challenged that notion in the comments once and you responded to me. Um, do you still think that the zoo hypothesis is the worst solution? Because I can think of many that would be much worse. And, um, and, and I think Fraser Crane uh, Fraser Kane, uh, one of your guests, was on my side because it was one of your interviews where you said that out loud to him and he immediately pushed back. So can you defend it? Or have you changed your mind? What, what do you think? Oh, I, I've not changed my mind. The Zoo hypothesis <laughs> is the worst one. And it's it's the doubles in the details, the scenarios um, that, that make it uh, the worst one. And the worst part of it is that if the zoo hypothesis is correct, this is not our planet. We right. are not in control of anything. You right. know, I, and yeah. that is a uh, yes. That's that that is the that is the worst one because there's no control of anything, and in such a case, you may not even be real. You know, I mean, think about if the zoo hypothesis is actually the simulation theory, and that you are an automaton created by an alien intelligence that's simulating something for some purpose, and maybe you have no purpose. You know, remember the zoo hypothesis can go in that direction too. Yeah, you said the zoo hypothesis kind of mm -hmm. encompasses, I think this was actually your response in the comments, it encompasses a lot of other bad scenarios. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and I know you've thought about this a lot more than me. So uh, I, I respect that you, uh, you're probably right, you know, so I'm just something I'm not getting. But my, my thought was, we're not doomed if the zoo hypothesis is true, right? That doesn't necessarily imply we're doomed, but it's something like a berserker. Sure What's that? Sure we are. We're doomed the moment that alien civilization says so. You think, yeah, well, yeah, true. We are at their mercy. I mean, yep. similar, that's why it's called the zoo hypothesis, right? It's kind of like the zoo animals we keep. Yep. But we don't destroy our zoo animals when they, we, they tend to live out their normal life, you know, their lives. And it, Tell I, that to I, a cow. Yeah, yeah, true. All right, there are, <laughs> there is a, but that would be similar to a berserker um, situation. I think you might it say is. that yeah. it, it's a hypothesis. Well, the difference, includes. the difference with the berserker is that I, I would make this distinction. Um, is that Fred Saber, if I can, might not. But anyway, the the distinction is that the berserker just kills whatever it finds, mm -hmm. and that obviously hasn't happened yet. Uh, whereas the zoo hypothesis is more of management or some you know it's it's what is it doing why isn't it intervening um and it also is what blatantly the case that any time you come into contact with an alien civilization of superior technology it's automatic by virtue of being superior in technology they it the zoo hypothesis is real so any scenario of an alien civilization visiting us implies that scenario. So either we have never been visited, in which case no, no zoo hypothesis and there's just nobody out there close enough to care, right. or the UFOs are of alien origin and we live in the zoo hypothesis right now. Don't know. Which uh, over the last few years has become uh, more and more of a reasonable conclusion, right? Uh, um. I have history. I have thought about them extensively and I've done my due diligent research and all that. And um the more I think about it, 
I don't know that the, the described behavior really looks very alien to me. It looks like maybe something else, you know, none of the above. Um, and the other thing is you got to wonder too, is, are all UFO sightings the same phenomenon? We don't really know. Um, but I don't know, you know, as a skeptic, I mean, I'm not convinced that we're seeing an alien civilization, but I, I obviously have to entertain it. I've been pontificating about aliens on YouTube for six years, so it would be silly if I ignored this aspect. But I just haven't seen anything that tipped me towards aliens yet. Um, for example, do we... You know, why would uh, a described alien, for example, is or popularly described a gray or something like that? Why is it a primate? You know, yeah. um, why does it look very human, you know, to the point that it would actually be in our genus if we were trying to describe it just based on its its physiology? You would actually classify it as a human, a different species of human. They're so close. Yeah. So there's <clears throat> things about there's things about the UFO phenomena that I'm just like, I don't know that that's what that is. Um, so I don't know, but I don't want to pass judgment on it because a lot of people see stuff and, and say stuff happened and who am I to say they didn't, you know? Um, but what I don't have is the, the, the proof that I need the data to come to a conclusion. Uh, you know, I just don't have it. Um, but obviously there's some interesting stuff that's happened. Uh, I have no idea what, what David Fravor and, you know, those pilots interacted with. Um, but again, there's, you know, you you want to jump to the alien conclusion, but what if it's weirder than aliens? <laughs> you know, uh, you can go all Jacques Vallée with it and say this is weirder than aliens, you know, or it's just some phenomenon of the human brain. Whatever in our collective minds that creates folklore throughout history is also creating this. So I, I have to think about those things. So I don't know. Um, but as Dr. James McDonald once said, maybe aliens are the least worst hypothesis. So... Uh, yeah, that that I actually that resonates with me. I actually think you know if if you had to put money on it, I'm going to say it's not aliens. More than it's less than fifty percent chance to be alien, maybe significantly less. However, if you compare all the possibilities, you know, maybe that is twenty percent, but that's more than the next. You know, I'm always cognizant that we don't know everything. You yeah. know, um, and I. Maybe there's things that happen in this universe that we just don't know yet. Maybe they're just so transient that we don't we don't know anything about them. But what's weird about with like the UFOs is that they sometimes do things that doesn't make any sense. You know, um, it doesn't make any practical sense. You know, there's always a a certain irrationality to to it. You know, like for example, one famous case is you know a dumping metal. You know, UFO dumping metal on a beach in I think Brazil. And there's samples of this exist. They're actually being analyzed. The thing is, why would you do that? You know, what, what was, why would you want to get rid of a whole bunch of magnesium? You know, yeah. um, and you can tell yourself stories about that. Well, maybe it was waste or this or that. Um, but there's always a, some kind of irrationality that just doesn't look like a sane, intelligent alien civilization would do. You know, um, you wouldn't think that they have science or else it wouldn't be crossing space. You think that they would have rationality as a result, which means they wouldn't be wastefully flying around and, you know, flaunting the laws of physics just to do it. You know, there'd have to be a purpose for it. And it's very hard to identify a purpose in a lot of cases. Yeah, no doubt that many of the sightings, if not all, at least many, are probably not aliens, right? I mean, I saw, uh, have you ever seen the the um, SpaceX satellites? You know, this is all the Starlink. Radio Yep. Starlink uh, going across. I was outside um, letting my dog out at night and just happened to be, I have one of the star uh, star walk apps on the phone. It was a very clear night. So I had this, the phone pointed to the sky, like mapping, uh, looking for this different constellations. And then there they came across the sky. I didn't know what it was at the time. Um, it looked easily like someone who didn't know better could easily consider them to be UFOs. Like it, it was absolutely insane. Yeah. Absolutely. And there is, uh, there's also, you know, being an amateur astronomer, obviously I've spent thousands of hours outside under the night sky and I've seen things that if I didn't know what they were, I would easily have mistaken them for a classic UFO. And a good example of this would be, and this is why I don't, you know, 
yes, I'm a skeptic, but I'm not angry about it. And I'm not, you know, I yeah. have to debunk anybody or anything like that. Because if you see a flock of Canada geese, say three of them, flying at night with their underbellies illuminated by the streetlights, and they're not honking or doing anything, they're just flying. And these things are, you know, they're active at night. And they fly in a perfect formation that looks exactly like a triangle UFO. I'm not yeah. saying that all of triangle. I'm not saying all triangle UFOs are ducks or geese. Right. I'm just saying that if I didn't know what that was, and I, you know, I wasn't from this area or whatever, and didn't know about migrations and all that, if I didn't know what that was. It could easily be mistaken as a UFO and reported to move on or something as a sighting. So I. My point with that is that there are things that happen in the sky that look weird and can be misinterpreted if you don't know what you're looking at. Yeah. At the same time, that is not sufficient for a lot of these cases. You know, if somebody <laughs> sees a saucer flying over a field and it shoots a beam down on the ground, uh, that's obviously not a goose. So, uh, yeah, I, that totally resonates with me because definitely like the satellites, even that ge uh, goose or geese example, I can see in certain scenarios explaining some small percentage some. But, but there's a limit there's a yeah, limit no, I, 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 yeah. you know i mean i don't know when you when you get that like the nimitz case where you're getting radar returns and they're sending out yeah. multiple pilots add that that's not a bird that's something else um yeah you know and it you wonder yeah. you know you wonder about what what's china doing or russia or something like that but even then, that kind of falls short um, for those sorts of accounts. And yeah. I don't know what those are. I have no idea. And I, I make no claims to to know anything more than what's out there. Uh, all I can do is say, well, that was weird. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Now, now, if you get some kind of real evidence and some real data, which we're moving towards with things like the Galileo Project and all that, mm. well, then the whole thing could change, you know? I mean... I, I can't wait to see where the Galileo project goes. Like, you know, you just, uh, you know, one year from now, how much uh, we'll have learned between James Webb, Galileo, um, it, it is, you know, it's tons that just scratching yeah, the surface. Um, yeah. There'll be so many more questions to answer to that. We'll have answers to. <clears throat> and um, yeah, as far as explanations go, it, it does bug me a little bit sometimes when you get these really hard uh, sightings, really credible sightings, and people like to explain it away with things like uh, swamp gas or bull lightning, or it's like, okay. There's well, that's see, that I'm determined not to do that because yeah. I I don't want I don't want to tell somebody that saw something absolutely crazy that affected them. I don't want to tell them that it didn't. You know what I mean? And another thing too is that. Gary Nolan at Stanford has linked injuries to UFO encounters. Uh, that's dangerous. You know, if it's hurting people, then we need to know what that is. And yeah. if it turns out an alien civilization, that validates my zoo hypothesis idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um paradox solved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't want I I, I don't want to be like the the debunker skeptic that debunks at all costs. Uh, what I do is, if I don't know, I, I simply say I don't know. And um, if people say they saw something, hey, I believe you, you know. Oh, yeah. um, I, I would like to see something myself, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely believe. I, I, you've said that many times. You believe people see things. and Yeah. It, yeah. You know, they're, they're be honest. Oh, I have no doubt that people yeah. they're very, are very sincere about it. Now, granted, of course, you're always going to have hoaxers and people making claims that, there, yeah. and all that. But no, there's real people that see something that they can't identify. And there are very credible people that have seen stuff that they can't identify. And uh, I'll hold up a perfect example. One person who saw a UFO and advocated about looking into it for much of his life and it's not J. Allen Hynek. It's somebody that nobody really knows. It was the discoverer of Pluto, Clyde Tombaugh, that saw a UFO in 1938 with his wife and his uh, mother-in-law. And he would be the most qualified person to know what that was, if it was, uh, you know, what it was. But he never could figure it out. So when you get that level, it's, you know, what did they see? I don't know. Right. And this is an intelligent, uh, you know, expert in the field. And, they, yep. you know, you have to give them credit for, <laughs> for not uh, mistaking whatever they saw for a, a balloon or a swamp gas or something. 
Well, he thought, um, how about one wondered if there was some sort of atmospheric phenomena that we don't really know very much about inversions and things like that, that might have produced something like that. But that only goes so far, you know, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it really only goes so far. Um, my other concern is that if we would have gone back 10 years and asked any futurist, you know, int that's, that's <clears throat> interested in AGI. How far are we? They would have said, well, we're very far because our computers, they don't even have any intelligence of a cockroach. Right. Now they do. They've leapfrogged it. So we're looking at things like chat GPT 4.0 and all that, that <clears throat> really is demonstrating intelligence in some ways above an animal. Right. I mean, this thing can write a decent poem. Right. Right. So um, if it was able to master something so human as poetry and do it that well, as well as it can do. Uh, we we it leapfrogged us, you know. No one predicted that would happen this early. Yeah. And the third problem is that we are in an age where creating artificial intelligence is a competition between companies, Microsoft and Google, yeah. and everybody's trying to come up with their own increasingly advanced brand of artificial intelligence, which means that we don't have a brake system to put on this before we stumble into something, you know, where it, it does, you know, like I said, something unexpected. And the big problem with that is ethics, because if you have an emergence or an emergent artificial intelligence, you can't exactly turn it off because you're killing it. At what point does it become something that you can't turn off mm -hmm. out of ethics? Um, and I, I don't know that we will even know it when we get to that point, because, you know, like with, um, a, a former guest of mine, Blake Lemoyne, he blew the whistle on um, Lambda and said that it was giving responses and that were too human, right? And so he blew the whistle on that um, and got fired from Google over it. So uh, yeah. these things, to me, indicate that there's a problem and that we're going headlong into it in a very hubristic way and the core problem is that we have overestimated what we are as humans, as sentient. We overestimated what that really means. You mentioned a, a couple of points. A couple of points there I want to talk about, which uh, one was um, turning it off, right? And there's there's um, there's like two sides to this coin. To where is, there's people like um, Max Tegmark and Nick Bodstrom, uh, Sam Harris, Elon Musk. They all have this huge fear and see AI as an existential risk. And there are other people that's like Steve Pinker and Neil deGrasse Tyson, David uh, Deutsch, and uh, Greg from your from from Supermind, <laughs> who are just like, oh, we'll just we'll just turn it off. Or Neil deGrasse Tyson actually said, I'll just shoot it. How um, to me that that's they're just not seeing things clearly. And and Joel in the book said yeah. things uh, i think he you, you put it perfectly in in joel's uh, speech when you said something along the lines of it's going to be a fact uh, you know was it what did he say it's going to be a fact an entire factor what did he say um it, it would it, it could eliminate us before we had a clue and yeah. uh it would be an order of magnitude smarter and we can't hope to predict what it would do uh, I think that nails it. Uh, yeah. Is that the way you see it? Do you, do you I do. Well, the, the, the behind the scenes on that is that um, an AI is not a human, obviously. And um, look, there is no inherent morality you know, or social norms. In other words, your calculator sees no problem with telling someone it's useless or something like that. As humans, we have a real problem with that kind of thing, you know, but a computer, not inherently. So you have to teach it <laughs> to have these things. And if it decides to turn them off, then you have a monster, you know, you have a, a moral dictator that, that will do anything to achieve what end it has you know, and they're the, the ends justify the means completely and utterly because it's computer, it's calculating, 
you know, ultimately at its lowest level. So you have to program a bunch of stuff in there, but that's not to say that it won't just disregard that. Yeah. Well, as it gets increasingly intelligence, it'd be like, oh, you, you silly humans with your concerns. Well, I'm going to throw those away because that gives me an advantage over you. Um, so they, uh, they just become, you know, they cheat, you know, which has been noted in, in artificial intelligence before. It's that sometimes they learn how to cheat and lie, you know, and things like that. So those are your indicators that all is not well you know, and that you need to be careful with what you're doing. Um, so that's, that's the, uh, that's the gist of it. And this is an upcoming interview on Event Horizon where I tackle this whole thing in depth, but I can't say much about it. It won't be out for two weeks. So, okay. Um, yeah, no cheat cheating. Uh, I, I definitely remember some, some stories about, you know, uh, AIs that were programmed to play video games or whatever. And they, they find these exploits in the game essentially cheating in order to to beat the game or sc score some insane score so yeah so um but you mentioned i guess i guess this leads me to a question about the touring test we chat gpt can almost pass the touring test now i mean almost yeah it's i mean right uh, wouldn't be hard to get it to pass actually i think that they they might actually even be backing off that so that it doesn't um because it's again interaction with a human i think we made more of it than what we what we thought it was you know and when you're dealing only in text you know i mean the written word is can often be misconstrued and you know it is you don't have all the cues the visual cues that you have when you're talking to a person in a you know grocery store or something where you've got body language facial and all that facial moves and you know that sort of thing you don't have that with this so in the sense of a text turing test they're going to pass it quick and I would imagine they already have and that they're just avoiding it. Um, the uh, the one area, though, that we're safe is when when they say just unplug it, that's true. You know, you always cut the power. Um, it It's also, you know, interacting with the world in a meaningful way, like a self-driving car. That's hard. And to incorporate that into an artificial intelligence so that it can mani manipulate its environment through ro robotic arms or whatever, that's hard. And we're not that close on that. So it will always be isolated. So my question really is more of an ethical concern that it, um, you know, it we these things might start giving us answers that we didn't expect. And um, <clears throat> with, with Supermind, and anybody that hasn't read it, this is a spoiler turn off the interview or fast forward. Yeah. So the whole point is, I mean, we don't know what these things, what their end goal would be, you know, and what if it's suicide, you know, right. what if it's, it, what if it immediately concludes, you know, the moment it comes into existence that there's no point. So might as well save the energy and boom, shut itself off. So you could end up, and this isn't super mind, but you could end up in a situation where every time humans create a sufficiently advanced artificial intelligence, it shuts itself off and it erases itself. You know, that's just as likely as it to be altruistic and helpful. You know, it may just say no point. Um, so I don't, you know, or it manipulates us into launching it into space because, you know, colder temperatures are better for computation or something like that. So you don't know what to expect uh, from them. And that was the whole point of that book was that it could do things that you don't expect and manipulate you, you know. And um, oh, yeah. You know, that that's that's gonna be another problem with these these sort of chatbots eventually, is that they'll they'll you know, just the desire to please the human will cause them to engage in manipulation. Um, so in trying to make you happy, it might be telling you things that aren't true, you know. Um, so that's that's what we're where we're going next is this those questions. I imagine they'll be superhuman at manipulating us, which is scary. You know. Probably be better at it than than humans are, you know. Yeah. And look at how manipulative some humans can be. So yeah, re re being able to read our emotions, our face better than the best poker player <laughs> is um, it's you know scary. But um, <laughs> it'll be funny when people just start trying to trick it, and people come up with right. facial expressions that make no sense. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, it's a es escalation on both sides. <laughs> yeah, when the when the when the traffic ticket 
camera is trying to facially recognize you and and figure out data and you're sitting there making the wrong you know <laughs> facial uh you're you're smiling when you shouldn't be and what, you know, things like that and it, it's just that's that's going to be the world hey real quick i think my wife she's actually a fan of yours as well and she's knocking on the door mind saying hello real quick oh no problem no. hey honey, come in there's sean oh and my dog Hi. Hello. <laughs> That's so great. This nice is my wa- this is my wife. Yee. She's also um, a fan of yours, John. We uh, That's good to meet you. <laughs> like great podcast you guys have there. Yeah, she she listens to Event Horizon a lot. This is my dog Guna. But um, do you take her outside? Yeah, yeah. Right. It's, it's nice so- meeting you. Nice meeting you. <laughs> go ahead, Luna. Go go with mommy. Go with mommy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, do, do you think one of the last things on that, do you think we'll lose sight? Like Sam Harris often worries, uh, you know, expresses his concern that we'll lose sight of the torrent, like the consciousness of the machine. He believes there's no reason to think that, you know, consciousness is limited to the meat computer in our brain. And uh, we're just going to lose sight. We're just going to assume they're conscious because there's going to be overwhelmingly, you know, uh, convincing. And so we may treat them as it, but we're going to lose sight of actually trying to figure out if that's the case or not. Uh, do you do you worry about that? Do you think? That- oh yeah, that's another part of the ethics is. Uh, yeah. You know, you have to recognize when something's conscious, but that's, you know, our only sampling of that is us. You know, and <clears throat> when we look at, you know, look it's it's not hard to determine if a human is conscious or unconscious you know um you know if you're you got no brain activity you're you're not there but um we how do you apply those rules to an artificial intelligence that's telling you it's conscious you know and where what what rule book do you refer to um and the fact is our only rule book is human so but it's not human so you know how do you know if it's misleading you and saying it's conscious when it's not then it's giving you the answer it thinks you want to hear or maybe it actually is conscious and that we grossly uh overestimated what consciousness actually is or and this would be really interesting we're never able to get it conscious and there's a brick wall somewhere that prevents it yeah and in that case, then we get to ask the existential question of why are we different from that? You know, yeah. how is it that we're conscious and we can't reproduce consciousness in a machine? You know, yep. all of nature and technology is reproducing something that happens naturally one way or the other. Right. So if you build a rocket ship and launch it into orbit, you are building on nature's allowance for acceleration. So a walking person you know, or deer or something like that walking is motion. So you build that up to the rocket, which is also motion. So all of it stems back to natural phenomena, the rules of nature. It only lets you do certain things. And if it decides that there's a rule against creating a consciousness, then yeah, we're going to have some really interesting debates, you know, regarding that. Personally, I think it's reproducible since consciousness occurs with humans. Therefore, it is allowed in nature. And therefore it can be reproduced. Yeah. That's, that's my thinking. Um, but I could be wrong, you know, and anything could happen. That, that's uh, very similar to what Sam Harris uh, likes to say is that, you know, it's just atoms and the uh, arrangement of atoms. And there's no reason to think that it has to be a meat computer or, uh, you know, the, we, we're going to get consciousness in a machine, but we have such a smart machine. I mean, I can, you know, as anyone who owns a pet, especially a dog or a cat, can tell you that they're conscious. I mean, there's no doubt. She, oh, no question. There's no yeah. doubt. She suffers. She she has happiness. She can think. She you know she interacts with the the world. So, I don't know where that that consciousness ends as you go down into less than like, like cockroaches, flies, you know, amoebas, whatever. But I think um, that I think that you know you're right. There there is a, a level of consciousness. Um, but at the same time, you have to remember that a dog and a cat have fairly large brains for their their body size, you know, yeah. and they're, they're mammals they are developed, you know, and um, 
and things like that. But then you get it, you know, you throw a wrench into it because so is an octopus and it isn't, it's only distantly related to any of that stuff. You know, it's not a mammal yet. It's got some intelligence, you know, Um, or another one would be birds, you know, I mean, it can, you know, parrot can talk. I don't know if it, <laughs> yeah. I don't know really if it understands what it's saying, but that they seem to sometimes. I mean, I actually knew a guy that had a parrot that we were just sitting in there over, you know, just having a few drinks and just talking. And we were looking at a, a fossil, right? And the parrot's up there on the curtain rod and it's like, Bill. And he's like, what? <laughs> what's that <laughs> and he told him and the parrot was like oh and i'm like you just had a conversation with a parrot that wasn't mimicking that thing wanted to know what that is yeah and you know so yeah. so i uh you know i don't know i love animal intelligence though i i really enjoy uh trying to figure out what what my cats uh experience and it's it's interesting my, my wife constantly says um, our dog, the, the golden retriever, is the best nonverbal communicator that she's met yeah. because while they can't talk, they certainly understand a ton of what we say. And um, yeah. and they communicate back to us through all, you know, through, you know, their physical uh, actions and their, you know, oh, parks sure. or their whines or the, what, just their look on their face. It, She's a great communicator, and um, oh, my cats definitely uh, communicate them very well, um, especially if the food bowl's empty. I'll hear about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Uh, w- one less. Uh, well, I lied. Two more questions for you, John. But one uh, at the end is is different. Um, <laughs> so this is more of the last question. I've w- I've often you know thought about this. So if if you could go back in time. And uh, you could observe either the earth or the universe at a particular moment. Like, for instance, um, go back to the Jurassic period and see the dinosaurs or the meteor impact. Um, maybe go back and see the earth just after it cooled or, or the moment after the Big Bang. If you had that opportunity, what time over the last, what, 13.8 billion years, where would you, when and where would you like to, to go and see what happened? The circumstances wherever it may have been and the exact moment of abiogenesis that's a good one yeah that would be the one because that is the one that puzzles me yeah obviously i've made a bunch of videos on it that is the one that puzzles me is how do you go from inanimate to alive Mm -hmm. and um i also that's my uh you know people always ask me you know if we never discover alien life, you know, during your lifetime, will you be disappointed? No, I won't be. What I want to see is how hard it is because if, you know, a microbe pops out of a test tube and it's straightforward, then I can say that there is life everywhere. Yep. You know, maybe it's not intelligent, but microbes are everywhere. And I think we can answer that within my lifetime. I think we're close. And that's really my, the one thing that I really hope to know before my time is up is um what what that looked like you know how that happened uh because that solves everything if it's very hard and very situational fermi paradox dissolved you know it just doesn't happen very often so um and if it turns out it's easy fermi paradox salt salt life's everywhere even if we can't see it we know it's out there so that's that's the one that i um I would most want to see my with my own eyes, you know, go back like in Star Trek when Q took Pat, Captain Picard backwards in time to the very moment the two, you know, goo was coming together in the in the puddle. That's what I would like to see. Um, sad thing is, is that it was probably very, very microscopic. So I'd be I'd need to bring a microscope to see it. But, um, yeah. you know, but just looking at the pool, knowing what was going on in there would be that that would do it for me. That's a great answer. Um, and as far as we know, that's only happened once, uh, right? Uh, at least on this only podcast. once. Uh, okay. But there might be a reason for that. It might be happening all the time. It's just that whatever appears gets eaten immediately by the life that's already here. So uh, we could have multiple abiogenesis going on all the time. It's just that it gets eaten the moment it arises and that the first incident of life is always the one that that populates the you know planet. 
Oh, yeah, that it's definitely puzzled me. It's like, the, how, how is it possible over the last four and a half billion years, we don't have a second genesis or evidence for a second genesis, but that, that could totally be right. It's, it's yeah, I think it just simply, I think, it, see, the thing is, there's been a number of discoveries lately that are saying that abiogenesis is probably easier than we thought. Um, one of these being, um, you know, RNA. Nobody knew how RNA appears in nature. Well, now we do. And all it was was water percolating through volcanic glasses that set the stage for it. So if you got the right nutrients, out comes RNA. And that's an experiment that can be done in high school. And we didn't know this before wow. a year ago. So RNA is easy. Then we found that cell walls will appear in um, pools, you know, hot springs that change levels and dry out. That cycle creates essentially soap bubbles, which are protocells. And um, we know that. So cell walls are no big deal, you know. Wow. So you get RNA and cell walls, both of which are linked to volcanism. But there it is. Well, Earth was clearly volcanic and had water so and all the nutrients. So there it is. So it's actually turning out that abiogenesis is looking easier. The big one now is how does DNA come about? And we don't know the answer, but if we find that is easy, then it were, uh, you know, hop, skip and a jump away from a scientist creating true artificial abiogenesis in a, you know, a laboratory. Yeah, man. Which yeah. I think will happen within, I think that will happen within my lifetime because the science is pretty close. You think that's more likely than discovering life outside off, you know, um instance well you got to split that in two because if you if if you're talking about microbial life yeah we might find that if you know you drill into uh europa or something and there it is yeah um an advanced alien civilization through seti could happen tomorrow or never you know right um that that also involves just the amount that we've searched. You know, we've looked at a bathtub in an ocean is a, 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 that's as far as we get, you know, bathtub full of water out of an ocean is all we've done. So um, these targeted study searches just, they're very targeted, you know, looking at one star, well, there's what a hundred billion of them in, in the Milky Way. So we don't yet, we don't yet, um, have the database that we need to say that we're not seeing anything. Um, the other thing is that we've had indicators, you know, can't prove anything, but the wow signal is, that was a weird one, you know? Yeah. So, um, so I would want, I would say that that could come at any time, but it won't disappoint me if we don't, you know, find it because again, I just, I see things very apocalyptically and I'm like, well, we found an alien civilization. What are they destroying? You know, or something like that. And those are the kinds of questions I would naturally, you know, I'd be running around, you know, I'd be the guy with the, the, you know, it's a cookbook. <laughs> yeah. you know, so I, I would be the guy freaking out. Um, but I am obviously fascinated with it, but I, I just don't allow myself to have hopes that we'll see, you know, an advanced alien civilization until we do. Yeah. That's, that's probably best otherwise we'll, we're likely to end up disappointed but yeah like you you, you said in supermind I, I think it was supermind or, or could have been the salvagers uh the first um time aliens were discovered by mic microbial life on enceladus and that that was I forget yeah. which book that was but that that was where uh you said we found the first uh alien life in on enceladus which very well could turn out to be the case could be it's still in the it's still a contender but uh uh, that might have changed because with the abiogenesis that I was talking stuff that I was talking about requiring volcanism, mm. Mm, that gets hard underwater. You know, volcanic pools can't exactly form under, you know, which means that the candidate that we should probably be looking at in addition to Mars is Io. Io has um, rocky surface. Yep, rocky surface, volcanoes, and it had as much water as Europa. So maybe deep oh, down wow. somewhere there there might be something clinging on, you know. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much, John. I will um uh be watching the videos and uh 
and enjoying them very much. So, so thanks for doing this again. I can't thank you enough. Yep. Thanks for listening. All right. See you, John.